first, I want to extend my thank you to the ACA for recognizing me with this award this year. It's incredibly, I'm incredibly honored, I'm incredibly excited um, for this recognition for not only me, but also my team. Um, and honestly, the award is really special to me. As you're going to see in the talk today, my group is really interested in organic solid state chemistry, hydrogen bonding, and properties of solid state materials which really was pioneered by Peggy Edder. So being able to actually get the award, you know, in a named for someone in my field is really exciting. So first of all, to get started, I'd like to extend a few thank yous. First of all, to Peggy, um, really for her invaluable contributions to the field of organic solid state chemistry. I think without her pioneering work, we wouldn't necessarily be where we are today. So I'm indebted to her for her work. And I never had the fortune to actually meet Peggy or see her give a lecture. But the University of Minnesota has recently put her three-part lecture series that she recorded in January of 1992 up on YouTube. So if you have not watched that, I would encourage you to do so. Um, and I was fortunate, I watched all three lectures. Um, and her enthusiasm for science and chemistry and everything is just incredibly infectious. So if you haven't watched it, please do it. And I was watching the lectures, and one thing she said really stuck out to me. And that was that being observant and being curious often has a very big payoff. And I think that's incredibly true in crystallography, science in general. And today, I hope I'll show you there's actually a couple instances for my students where just them being observant and curious, I think, really paid off for them. I'd like to extend a thank you to Krista Ackroyd for organizing my nomination for the award and incredible support of my career, as well as the letter writers who contributed to my nomination, really without all of their support um, and putting me up for this, I wouldn't be able to stand here today. I'd like to acknowledge my PhD advisor, Len McGilvery. Uh, Len really sort of initiated my interest in organic solid state chemistry and been, um, has been supportive of me pursuing that in my independent career. And the other nice thing is Len was actually a former recipient of this award, so it makes it even more special to receive an award that your PhD advisor received. Um, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of collaborators whose names you're going to see today. Ryan Greneman, who's at a, um, Webster University in St. Louis, which is a PUI, um, collaborates with us. Um, Eric Reinheimer, who's at Ragaku, helped us with a little bit of crystallography problem. You'll see that sort of mid-talk. I'd like to acknowledge my postdoc advisor, Jeff Moore, who's incredibly supportive. I, Jeff taught me polymer chemistry, which I had never learned before, and has just been incredibly supportive of my career. My crystallographer for the past five years, Daniel Unruh, who is uh, very dedicated to teaching students about crystallography and is really um, instrumental to the success of my lab. Um, and then collaborators, Michael Finlater and Wei Yan. The next group of people I'd like to acknowledge are my research group. So really without them, I would not be standing here. So this is as much of an award for me as it is for them. I've had the fortune of working with high school students, um, undergraduates, PhD students, and a postdoc. And really, um, it's exciting for me to have them come into my lab. And the fact that they choose to come into my lab and work with me every day is really exciting. It makes it exciting for me to go to work. Um, so I'll acknowledge each of them and their projects as we go throughout the talk. But overall, just incredibly grateful to my past and present group. So with that, I'm going to dive into the talk today. First of all, I just want to give you an overview of the work that my group does. The top project is what I'm going to spend the uh, first half of the talk talking about today, and that is in controlling how materials respond to a change in temperature. The second project I'm going to talk about in the second half today is how we um, try to modify pharmaceuticals in order to improve properties or adjust challenges in crystallization, specifically materials that are difficult to crystallize. And then the third project, which I won't talk about today, is mostly designed of polymer-based materials that can either capture a contaminant or something of value. So specifically what we're working on right now is rare earth elements with some post-gas chemistry. So I want to start with a quote from John Maddox that was published in Nature in the late 80s, where he says that one of the continuing scandals in the physical sciences is that it remains in general impossible to predict the structure of even the simplest solids crystalline solids from a knowledge of their chemical composition. So essentially, you can draw a structure on paper, or you can go into the lab and make it, but there's no way to really know ahead of time how that molecule is going to actually assemble into a three-dimensional structure. Um, now, crystal structure prediction is incredibly pushing this forward a lot, right? But as the molecule gets more conformationally flexible or larger, this does is still non-trivial to predict how it's going to pack. And so why do we care about that? Really because we know that as chemists, the sh chemical structure of the molecule influences its properties, 
but also the three-dimensional solid state structure influences the properties. So it's important to be able to control or understand the structure if you want to get a certain property at the end. And so just to show you a couple examples of organic-based solids and how those materials are affected by their structure. So acetaminophen or paracetamol has three known forms or polymers. Form one is the thermodynamically stable form and it packs in sort of a zigzag packing motif. Um, and although it's the thermodynamically stable form, it actually has very poor compaction properties. So if you try to make it into a tablet, it actually falls apart. Form two, which is not thermodynamically stable, packs in a more of a planar arrangement and has really excellent compaction properties, but it's not super useful because it's not thermodynamically stable. So the structure affects that property. Another example which the audience might be familiar with is the compound ROI, um, which I believe currently holds the record for the most known polymorphs for a single component solid. It's either 13 or 14. Um, it's a precursor to an antipsychotic drug, and it does have um, torsional flexibility here and gives rise to a number of different colored polymorphs as well as different crystal habits. So optical properties are another thing affected by structure. So a technique that my group has taken on in order to modify solid state structure is that of co-crystallization. So this is where you combine at least two compounds together in order to generate a unique solid phase. And the reason I like co-crystallization is oftentimes the co-crystal will exhibit properties that are unique when compared to the individual components. So often you can take two compounds that do not have a you know, given property you're looking for, but upon co-crystallization, because you change the solid state structure in the three-dimensional arrangement, you can often turn on a property, or maybe you can even turn off a property that would be undesirable. So in order to get two things to crystallize together, what we're going to need is those two compounds need to want to crystallize together rather than independently. And so we're going to direct those to interact by some sort of non-covalent interaction with each other. Today I'm going to focus on hydrogen bonding as well as halogen bonding. And if you're not familiar with halogen bonding, it's basically like hydrogen bonding, but it's got halogens instead of hydrogens. So a couple examples from work not by our group on using co-crystallization to change properties. One back to acetaminophen or paracetamol. Bill Jones' group essentially co-crystallized this with secondary components in order to make structures that were more similar to form two, and thus then they were able to make tablets that had really nice shapes and did not fall apart. So that's one type of method you can use. Um, Miguel Garcia Dara Base Group has done a lot of work with molecular rotors, mostly covalently bonded rotors. Um, and I'm going to show you a lot of molecular motion today, but their group has also done co-crystalline rotors as well. Christopher Ackerman's group has looked at modifying um, thermal stability of explosives. So um, increasing thermal stability while decreasing impact sensitivity, but retaining the inherent explosive nature. And then Tomislav Frischitz's group um, has looked at dichroic behavior, so taking two compounds that are either weakly or non-dichroic, and upon co-crystallization, you can make a compound that's very strongly dichroic, as you see here. So the property I'm going to focus on first today is that of thermal expansion. And this is a property you see all the time in your daily life. It's when a material changes in response to a change in temperature. And the most common type of thermal expansion is positive. So you heat it up, it gets bigger, or you cool it and it gets smaller. That's sort of the intuitive way of thinking about it. Negative is just the inverse of that, and it's a rare property in molecular solids. And then zero thermal expansion is also very rare, and it's when a material does not respond to a change in temperature. So Pyrex glass is a nearly zero thermal expansion based material. And the reason that my group is interested in this is that how a material responds to a change in temperature affects its ability to function. So if it's exposed to heat or cold and it just fractures immediately, then you're stuck with something that is not useful. It affects things like mechanical properties. It's really important in device fabrication, especially as we move to organic semiconductors, to match all the components of the device so that you don't have fractures at the interfaces and things. And depending on your application, you actually will want a certain thermal expansion property. So if you want to design an actuator or a sensor, you want probably a large response to temperature change. But if you want something like a device, it depends on all the components, what type of expansion you want. And in things like aerospace, actually that needs that really small expansion because you need to have it withstand large temperature fluctuations without fracture. So again, my group is interested mostly in organics and organic semiconductor type of structures. And so as we move into these applications, it's important to be able to understand how it responds and then be able to tailor it depending on what you want. So today I'm going to show you some coefficients of thermal expansion. And the way that we can calculate these is that we do variable temperature single crystal x-ray refraction. And so we do this over a large temperature range. 
And we use a freely available program called Pascal. They just released version two, um, like two weeks ago, so it's up on, online. Um, and this program, what you're gonna input is your variable temperature unit cell parameters. My group actually collects full x-ray data sets, even though you only need the unit cell parameters for the calculation, because we look at structural changes as well. And what this program is gonna calculate is three linear coefficients, as well as a volumetric, and this is what the output kind of looks like. It's a little bit small. Um, but it's going to calculate the three axes of thermal expansion, so x1, 2, and 3, and give you the value along those. Um, and x1 is always the most negative or the smallest positive, while x3 is always the largest positive value. Gives you an error in that number. And then a direction along the A, B, and C axes. Now, sometimes this is perfectly along an axis, like perfectly along the B axis, but organics are often low symmetry, so sometimes you would end up with more of a you know, combination of the axes. And you can just use mercury to figure out where this is happening in the structure. Um, as a benchmark, the field has currently termed anything over 100 as colossal or very large thermal expansion, whereas coefficients that are in the range of 0 to 20 are a little bit more you know, typical of materials. So one thing we know, and I'll touch on this on the next slide, is that stronger interactions are generally less affected by temperature, which probably makes sense. And I just want to show you a couple examples of really materials that exhibit very large coefficients that are purely organic. So the two examples on the right are published by Len Barber's group. The top is a dyon diol molecule. It's just a single component solid, and it undergoes an accordion-like motion with change in temperature to give rise to a coefficient of 515. So I believe this is one of the highest, if not the highest, reported for a purely organic solid. The bottom are just simple complexes of 18 pound 6 ether with different guests inside. And you can see that by changing the guests, you can get really large differences in thermal expansion behavior. And the one on the left, published by the DOS group, is a two component solid. And it actually undergoes a scissor like motion with change in temperature to give negative expansion on one direction and positive on the other direction. So if we know that stronger interactions are less affected by temperature, <coughs> Ideally, what we want to do is just control self-assembly in 3D. But again, if you're thinking about purely organics not using like metal coordination, this is a little bit tricky. If you pick your molecule appropriately, you can probably form a one-dimensional chain relatively reasonably if you, again, have some non covalent interactions. And even the second dimension, you might be able to control pretty well. But in purely organics, I would say the third dimension is, is still difficult to control. It might also mostly be dictated by van der Waals or packing effects. But ideally, if we want to control TE in all directions, we want to build up this structure just like you would a metal organic framework with really clear interactions in each direction. And then ideally use stronger or weaker interactions by these colored bonds in order to get large expansion maybe one way and small expansion another way. But it ultimately relies on total self-assembly control in 3D, which I don't think we're completely there yet. The other strategy my group has taken that I'm going to talk about today is incorporating groups that can undergo molecular motion in the crystalline state in response to temperature change to give rise to large expansion. And at the end, I'll just show you one quick thing we started looking at of doing solid state covalent bond forming reactions in order to covalently connect molecules and then change the thermal expansion because we're going from non-covalent to covalent bonds. Okay. So the motion I'm going to tell you about today is really a conformational interconversion between two positions. So you can see a video playing here. It's colloquially termed pedal motion because people think it looks like the pedals of a bicycle. Um, olefin groups and azo groups are well known to undergo this type of motion in the crystalline state. And the way that we're going to characterize this is by variable temperature single crystal x-ray diffraction. So if you have a molecule undergoing motion, you mount your crystal, collect data, solve the structure, and what you're going to see if it's undergoing motion is you're going to see it as a disorder. And you're going to quantify the percentages that I have shown in green and in gray. Then what you're going to do is change the temperature, collect data, and if those percentages change as a function of temperature, that's indicative of dynamic interconversion in the crystalline state or solid state motion. If those percentages remain constant, that's indicative of a static disorder rather than the dynamic. Or the other thing that's important is just because you put a CC double bond or an NN double bond into your molecule does not mean it's going to undergo motion because there are crystal packing effects that either promote that or inhibit it. So the molecule on the screen as a single component solid does not undergo solid state motion, but I'll show you that once we co-crystallize it and change the solid state structure, we can turn on that motion capability. So if you only have um, one conformation, that's indicative that either motion has stopped or it's not happening at all in the first place. 
All right, so what I decided to do when I first started the group was to look at isolated motion capable units in zero D assemblies, so discrete assemblies, essentially not even controlling in one D yet. So we took a ditopic hydrogen bond donor and a ditopic hydrogen bond acceptor and crystallized these in a one-to-one -one ratio. So they self-assemble essentially into a two-to-two -to, -two to give you these discrete units. And we're just not controlling how this packs with anything else around it. We're only directing this interaction first. And what we did is we took motion-capable azo or olefin here in the middle, um, or motion-incapable acetylene as a control. And all the co-crystal synthesis in this section is just by slow solvent evaporation and just optimizing so you don't get individual crystals of the two components, but rather you get the co-crystal. So at about room temperature, what we see in the case of the azo is it is disordered. Um, the rings are also disordered, but for clarity in the pictures, I'm just going to show you disorder in the middle group. Um, so azo is disordered, olefin is disordered, and the acetylene is not. As we cool it down, we did um, data every 20 Kelvin, and what we can see in the azo is when we get to 190, it is still disordered, and the site occupancies have changed by about 15% from top to bottom, so it is undergoing motion. In the case of the olefin, it actually locks into one conformation at 210 Kelvin, so undergoes motion and then motion ceases on cooling, and you only see one conformation. And again, acetylene is just a control. So those discrete units pack adjacent to each other just kind of by offset high stacking. We really weren't directing this in any way. The least expansion in the solid occurs along the hydrogen bonding direction, which is the strongest interaction holding the units together. But what was more interesting was where the most expansion happened. So all three solids are isostructural, regardless of the bridge group. And the most expansion occurred along the high stacking direction, or the direction we think pedal motion would be contributing. And in the case of the azo that underwent motion the whole time, we saw the largest coefficient. The olefin that underwent motion part of the time had the middle coefficient, and the acetylene, which did not undergo motion, had the smallest coefficient. So this showed us first that in an isostructural set, there's a difference in behavior of a system undergoing motion versus one that is not undergoing motion. So what we've done since then, we've expanded and started looking at what are called mixed co-crystals or co-crystal solid solutions. So what I just showed you was a regular co-crystal. In a mixed co-crystal, you're going to keep one of those components constant at 100% occupancy. And in the second position, you're going to take two molecules and mix those in, and that's your solid solution component. So part of it is 100%, the other part is the mixed part. And um, A plus B here totals to 100% occupancy. So this is work by my former graduate student, Shaudin or Danny. And what Danny decided to do was go back to our original study and mix in motion capable and incapable molecules into that site in order to fine tune how much motion was happening and ideally fine tune the thermal expansion behavior. So I'm gonna just walk you through what she set up. So she took 75% azo, 25% acetylene, so motion capable and incapable, 50-50, and then 25-75. Same three ratios with a motion-capable olefin and incapable acetylene. And then she also made the double motion-capable step with the azo and the olefin. So total of nine mixed co-crystals. She did six temperatures per co-crystal, giving us a total of 54 unique x-ray structures to look at. The cool thing is you can back up what you see um, or what you set up in the lab. You can verify by the crystals by NMR spectroscopy. The ratios correlate really nicely. And the great thing is we could see everything by x-ray diffraction, which we didn't know if we would immediately, but it worked out perfectly. In the case of the azo acetylene, you can see two sites for the azo, one for the major site, the site that's over 50%, and the minor site that's the less one. Um, and then acetylene is nice and linear there right across the center. In the case of the azo and the olefin, same thing, two positions for the azo, one for the olefin, and then for the olefin acetylene, again, two positions for the olefin, and then acetylene is linear. It's all kind of gray, but they're all three there. So the goal is to fine tune motion. And so what you're looking at here is a plot of the minor occupancy versus temperature. So if the minor goes to zero, that means the major is 100%. Thus, you have no motion occurring anymore. And so in the case of the azo mixtures, what we see is you put less azo in, you get less motion. As you cool it, you get less motion. But it ultimately never stops. It never goes to zero. In the case of the olefin acetylene mixtures, same thing. Less olefin gives you less motion. Cooling gives you less motion, but in the olefin cases, we actually saw ordering. And at 25%, we didn't feel we had strong enough crystallographic evidence to actually warrant modeling a second position um, of a disordered site. 
And so how does this affect the TE? Essentially, um, in the motion, uh, what you have is motion capable percent here, 25 to 75. So more motion capable group in the mixture gives you more motion and also gives you higher thermal expansion coefficient. And we have the highest coefficients actually in the double motion capable set. So what we decided to do next was, so this was the first study looking at using mixed co-crystals to try to fine tune thermal expansion. So next what we wanted to do is try to see if that was a one-off or if we could have another system that would do this. And if you look at the mixed co-crystal literature, mixed co-crystals are relatively <coughs> underexplored. Most of them are zero B assemblies, which is what I just showed you. And most of them are hydrogen bonded, which is also what I just showed you. Um, the reason they are underexplored is because you cannot just walk into the lab and pick three compounds off the shelf and make a mixed co-crystal. You're probably going to get single component crystals or you might get a co-crystal of the two that most likely want to crystallize. You essentially need to have two of those molecules that are going to compete for occupancy in the same position and compete equally for the non covalent interactions that are holding it there. So it's not trivial to just make one by just picking three random molecules. And so we set out to do a few things. One, we wanted to get past a zero D assembly and at least make a one-dimensional chain structure. We wanted to use something that wasn't hydrogen bonding and ideally demonstrate that we could use this as a platform for fine-tuning behavior. So we went back to um, a paper we had done earlier. This is work by my graduate student, Nofkerman, and she had taken diode of tetrachlorobenzene as a halogen bond donor and the same three bipyridines, and these crystallized into an infinite one-dimensional halogen bonded chain. In this study, actually, the olefin underwent motion the whole time and gave us the, or well, I think it was only part of the time, uh, but gave us the largest TE coefficient. The azo was actually statically disordered and gave us a coefficient that was similar to the acetylene. So that was kind of nice because it showed us, again, a, a static disorder is different than a dynamic one. Uh, but we selected the olefin and the acetylene and made mixed co-crystals where we keep um, the diodo compound at 100% occupancy and we're going to mix in the two bipyridines into the site, the same three ratios we did in the last study. So, all three samples are isostructural by single crystalline powder X-ray diffraction. Um, by SEM or just optical microscopy, you can see they have a very similar morphology. They're just kind of blocky. With the help of Martin Tua and Elena Pauls at Iowa State, we were able to do SEM EDS. And that showed us all three samples had an even distribution of heavy atoms and that the percent of carbon, nitrogen, chlorine, and iodine across all three are similar. So in the bulk level, all three materials appear to be isostructural, but there are differences at the molecular level. So when you solve the x-ray structure, here you can see two positions for the olefin, again one for the acetylene there, and this is the um, one-dimensional halogen bonded chain. It is infinite, I just have a piece of it shown here. So just like the last study, you can back up what you set in the lab by NMR spectroscopy. It correlates really nicely as does single crystal x-ray diffraction. In this case, the olefin, um, we only saw two positions at the higher percent incorporation, 75%, and only one position at the lower incorporation. Um, and in this case, motion actually contributes to two different directions when we look at the thermal expansion because of the extended packing. So what you see here is the regular co-crystal of the olefin here at the top and the regular co-crystal of the acetylene at the bottom and these three mixtures are here in the middle. And if you look at the directions of TE along X2 and X3 where that motion contributes, you can see the coefficients just systematically get smaller as you put more and more motion capable molecule into that mixed co-crystal. So again, showing that this is, um, even if the bulk material is isostructural, differences at the molecular level can give rise to differences in so the next story I'm going to tell you is about this molecule, di um, a diazo compound, two azo groups, two iodines on the outside, and it is a single component solid. So this is back to work by my graduate student, Danny. She had done a huge study that's uh, published in IUCRJ with uh, molecules that had different lengths, so different number of aromatic rings, different number of motion-capable groups. She did one or two azos, olefins, and imine groups as well. And then different halogens on the outside, either two iodines, two bromines, or unsymmetrical iodobromos. Ton of x-ray data. There's 101 unique x-ray structures in that paper, and she did a phenomenal job on it. Um, if you're interested in the synthesis or crystallization, I'll refer you to that. But in this study, we, this molecule was a little bit interesting and showed some different behaviors, so we investigated it further after the fact. And so what I'm going to start with is actually above room temperature. So this molecule above room temp, 320K, um, lies in an orthorhombic crystal system, and there is half of one unique molecule in the asymmetric unit. And that um, half is disordered, so the azo group as well as the rings are disordered. 
Upon cooling, it does undergo solid state motion, so we see changes in the site occupancies with respect to temperature. And because every molecule is identical, when you look at the extended structure, which I'll show you in a minute, if you look at the major sites of the azos on one molecule compared to the next, the major sites of the azos are all aligned parallel in the extended structure. And then I'll show you what happens next. So once we got to about 270K or so, we saw evidence of a phase transition where the molecule was switching into a monoclinic crystal system. And at this point, what we see is we actually now have two half unique molecules in the asymmetric unit, one that is still disordered, the other one that is fully occupied. So motion has basically ceased here. When we continue to cool this down, the disordered one undergoes motion to a, quite a low temperature, um, past about 190 Kelvin, it still is undergoing motion. And after this switch, if you look at the neighboring molecules, the only site of this azo and the major site of this one, they actually lie anti-parallel after the switch. And so essentially if you start at low temp, you can think about it the reverse way. Low temp eventually, once you heat it up, you give it enough thermal energy so this one starts undergoing motion and then they actually coalesce to the same occupancy value and it's <laughs> symmetrical. So kind of an interesting behavior. And so looking at the extended structure, again, it's a single component. It's got two iodines, so this self assembles into a two-dimensional halogen bonded sheet, type two iodine, iodine halogen bonds. Um, this two-dimensional sheet packs with adjacent ones by pairing bone packing motif. So the next sheet down is twisted when compared to the first one. And so what we did is we looked at the higher temperature data. So before this switch, we looked at the thermal expansion and we saw something really interesting. So the least thermal expansion and the middle thermal expansion occur in the 2D halogen bonded sheet, which are the strongest forces holding it together. And we saw the coefficients were kind of interesting. One coefficient um, was approximately equal to the second coefficient, but opposite in sign. So together we get two dimensional area, zero thermal expansion because of these two cancel out. Then along the pi sac direction, we actually get colossal positive expansion with a coefficient of 211. So we get two dimensional area, um, zero thermal expansion due to canceling, and then we get really large anisotropic expansion along the pi stacking direction. So this was really interesting for us because we hadn't really seen this sort of canceling effect before. And so we decided to investigate a little bit further. So we took one single crystal and we collected 45 full x-ray data structures on it. So we mounted it at 320, cooled it down in 10K increments to 100, and then warmed it up. Again, full data at every temp, not just a unit cell. My crystallographer was like, Kristen, you're killing me a little bit. It was like, just, just do it one time, just do it twice, it'll be fine. Um, it did survive, actually, which is great. Um, but we really wanted to get an idea of if this transition was actually reversible, if it was repeatable, and look at the thermal expansion in the two regions. And so what was really interesting is in this high temp region, we again reproduce both on heating and on cooling, we reproduce the two dimensional area zero thermal expansion and the colossal expansion on the pi sac. But in the low temp region, what we see is actually really, you know, nothing exciting. All over positive thermal expansion coefficients of 20, 40, a little bit higher here, but definitely not what we see there. So this is a material that exhibits switchable thermal expansion depending on which temperature regime you're on, and it is fully reproducible and repeatable. The other thing is with the help of my colleague Ben Wiley, we were able to do some solid state in MR. So when those molecules switch from a parallel arrangement to an anti-parallel arrangement, that favors formation of CHN hydrogen bonding involving the azo groups. And so what we could see in the solid state NMR is the carbons that participate in that, we see additional signals and shifting of signals so we could back up what we saw in the single crystal x-ray. Um, so this was just came out in the last week or two. Uh, it took quite a while to finish everything, so we're pretty excited to have that out, and I'll refer you to it uh, if you want more info. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about our pharmaceutical work. So why we're interested in pharmaceuticals is oftentimes when drug candidates are being developed, uh, you have start with thousands of candidates and ultimately maybe makes it to one FDA approved drug. And many of those drugs fail during development for a variety of reasons. Some of that is poor solubility or poor stability can be challenging. Um, another one is controlling crystal form or controlling polymorphs can be really problematic um, because polymorphs can often exhibit different properties. And the room might be familiar with this case, but if you're not, a great case of this is the antiretroviral rotonavir, which was developed um, in the height of the HIV AIDS crisis to treat this disease. 
And so um, the drug was actually on the market for approximately two years or so, and only one polymorph was identified, form one. And then during batch synthesis, a second polymorph appeared, form two, and form one was unable to be reproduced. And form two, the hydrogen bonding network, which is you know pretty complex given that molecule, um, was significantly different, and then the molecule exhibited significantly different solubility um, properties as form two instead of form one. So it had to be pulled from shelves, which was not only like incredibly cost problematic, but also in the height of the HIV AIDS crisis was really problematic for many patients worldwide. And so polymorph screening is a critical component, and we're interested in not only controlling the polymorph, but can we actually change one polymorph to another if we have non-ideal properties. Um, the other thing I'll point out is Aurora Cruz Cabezas group just published this paper on Chem Archive. I haven't seen it come onto a, a full journal just yet, um, but they were using milling and they're actually able to reproduce the Form 1 polymorph. So I'm assuming that's out in peer review, but they dropped it on Chem Archive first. So I'll refer you to that if you're interested. Um, the other thing we're interested in addressing is when we have difficulty accessing solid forms or difficulty crystallizing compounds. So some natural products or oils and things can present those problems during development. So we're trying to develop methods to crystallize things that are sort of frustrating. Um, and we're also going to be using some green synthetic methods, some like low solvent using ones, which I'll point out to you. So the first story I want to tell you about is that of the drug trimethoprim. So trimethoprim is what's called a BCS class two drug, meaning it has poor aqueous solubility. And this is work by my former graduate student, Chi Xuan. And uh, he had set out in order to co-crystallize this and ideally improve the solubility. That was sort of our first goal. So he picked a number of different second components, but I'm just going to show you two of them that were most promising at the time. One, we use nicotinic acid, and nicotinic acid is on the FDA's generally recognized as safe list. And that's a good list to pick from if you're trying to push a pharmaceutical forward because that list is going to have compounds that are safe to give to people, right? And so we chose nicotinic acid for that reason, and Ethan made a two different forms, a salt hydrate as well as a salt solvate with this. And then we also just used the isomer, isonicotinic acid, and he was able to get a salt solvate of this. So first with the hydrate with nicotinic acid, what we could see in the structure um, is we kind of figured the acid would have a couple points to hydrogen bond on here. We weren't sure exactly which side, but we saw a nice two-point hydrogen bonding synth on there with the ring of the trimethoprim. The acid is actually deprotonated and proton transferred to the ring of the trimethoprim, so it is actually salt. It's not a co-crystal because it's not neutral. Um, but this forms a beautiful two-dimensional hydrogen bonded sheet with water here um, uh, very involved in the hydrogen bonding network. In the case of um, nicotinic acid with the solvate, Ethan got a solvate with ethanol, and we saw persistence of that um, supermolecular synthon, so the two-point hydrogen bond with the acid, also deprotonated and protonating the ring of trimethoprim. It's a little hard to find, but ethanol is kind of sandwiched here, participating in the hydrogen bonding adjacent as well. And then with isonicotinic acid, same two-point hydrogen bonding, same proton transfer, um, this time a solvate with nitromethane. So this one not so exciting because you definitely don't want to give patients nitromethane. Um, and the ethanol solvate, safe to give to patients, probably not on purpose, quite so exciting, right? Don't want to give people ethanol as a dosage. So the hydrate was the one we were kind of most excited about as a potential application. And so Ethan went ahead and did solubility studies for all of these um, and so what we saw in the case of that hydrate is we had 10 times higher aqueous solubility when compared to the drug by itself. So that was pretty exciting um, in that big increase in solubility. We also did thermal stability because it's important to know um, that you're not significantly <coughs> modifying the thermal stability of the drug or you're not making it, you know, it's having to be stable on the bench, for example. Um, decomposition off onsets were really similar compared to trimethoprim by itself, so we weren't making it, you know, incredibly unstable. Um, with the solvates and the hydrates, one problem we had thought about is you could, in theory, lose that water or solvent from the lattice over time. So we just did a really quick bench stability study, just um, freshly synthesized hydrate salt and set it on the bench for 10 days open to air. It does retain crystallinity. It does retain the water over that time. You'd have to do it way longer than 10 days if you actually wanted to market it. But if you take a single crystal and put it on the diffractometer and then crank up the heat, the water does go out of the lattice and the crystal falls apart. So once the water is gone, the crystallinity is not retained. So that was a little bit concerning for us. If you want to think about a long-term application, that could be problematic. Um, 
In the case of the ethanol and nitromethane forms, those actually lost solvent in just exposure to air sitting on the bench. Um, again, we weren't as excited about those for the obvious reasons, but um, really with all of these, we were kind of, you know, had some good initial results, but ultimately wanted to target something that maybe didn't have a solvent in it so that we wouldn't have to worry about losing it, losing crystalline over time. And so then my graduate student, Liu Lei, came on board, and what we decided to do then was keep the trimethoprim, but we wanted to use compounds that were only on the recognized as safe list. Because again, if we want to push it forward, we don't want to have to go through you know, an approval for the other second component. And so we selected groups that had carboxylic acids because in the other study, we had seen the persistence of that nice carboxylic acid um, two-point hydrogen bond. We also got some nice solubility, so we decided to stick with that. And we chose DLA and LLA as our second components. And so Liuli did co-crystallization of these. And with DLA, he actually got two polymorphs, what I'm going to call an alpha and a beta form. And with LLA, he got two forms, what I'm going to call an alpha and a beta form. And by solution co-crystallization, these are actually, we do get proton transfers, so they're actually salt. But when we tried to co-crystallize these, sometimes we would, would get single polymorphs, so an alpha or a beta, but a lot of times he was getting concomitant polymorphs, so getting alpha and beta simultaneously. So really we didn't have a good way in solution to control what polymorph we were getting. So I'm going to show you the structures of the DLA first. So alpha's on the top, beta's on the bottom, and I'm sure you can instantly see the difference between the structures. I'm just kidding, they're like super similar, right? So if you look at the hydrogen bonding network, they are essentially identical. So what's the difference in the polymorph? If you look at the methoxy, the paramethoxy groups on the trimethoprim, in the alpha form, those are running in opposite directions. In the beta form, they are all pointing into the same direction in the sheet. The hydrogen bonding network is identical. That's the only difference in the alpha and beta. So very, very minor difference. In the case of LLA, we have the same difference in the alpha and the beta polymorphs. The methoxy groups either organize opposite or same directions. But in the beta polymorph, only with LLA, there's actually a difference in the bottom part of the sheet. So the top part of the sheet has that nice two-point hydrogen bond, very similar to all the other sets. But the bottom part has the LLA actually making a one-dimensional hydrogen bonded chain instead of that two-point hydrogen bond we had seen in all the other cases. So that one has a little bit more of a difference by comparison. <clears throat> so the problem was we didn't have good control in solution. And so what we decided to do was turn to a mechanochemical method. Mechanochemistry, if you're not familiar with it, is using is chemical synthesis that's either enabled or sustained by mechanical force. So the easiest way to do this is just by hand with a mortar and pestle, um, which is what my graduate students and undergraduates did originally when we started into mechanochemistry. Over time, people get a little tired. Um, and then also, it can get a little bit difficult to reproduce because honestly, how strong someone is affects how long it takes to like do the synthesis by hand. Um, and so eventually, we were like, come on, Kristen, can we get something automated? Yeah. And I gave in because we had some good results. And so we have a mill that actually does this automatically. What, what a grad student or an undergraduate can do in an hour and a half, this thing can do in five minutes. So it saves time and it's a little bit more reproducible. Um, and so what we decided to do first was try to make the salts by neat milling. So just taking the two components, neat milling them. Um, and what we saw was that actually we had a little bit of formation of the alpha forms with excess trimethoprim, and it's this red one here, you can see it's also partially amorphous. So it wasn't totally great by meat milling, so we decided to turn to liquid-assisted grinding, which is incredibly common. Um, and our goal was, if we could use different liquid additives, could we specifically get the alpha or the beta form? So Liule did a significant solvent screen for this, and the nice thing was with liquid-assisted grinding, if you use ethanol, you can make the alpha form specifically. If you use 50 microliters of acetonitrile, you can make the beta form specifically. Um, there were other solvents that also gave us one or the other, but these solvents also used, um, also were the same ones that worked for slurry preparation. So we did slurry preparation in solution, ethanol gave the alpha form specifically, acetonitrile gave the beta forms. So this finally offered us control to get one or the other. So then we wanted to push forward and look at properties of those, because ultimately the goal was to improve solubility. Um, we also did thermal characterization. All four polymorphs melt and decompose in the same two degree window, so very, very similar. And if the hydrogen bonding network is really similar, that's probably not surprising that the thermal properties are, are similar. But then we wanted to do solubility testing, and we were a little bit worried because we had two polymorphs. 
So we took all four of them and we stirred them in water to just see what would happen. The alpha forms are stable in water. You stir them in water, they say alpha. But the beta forms, if you stir them in water, they switched to the alpha forms. So I'm going to touch what we did next. But So we only did solubility for the alpha forms because of that switching. And what we saw is depending on pH, we had anywhere from one to five times higher aqueous solubility when compared to the drug. So the drug is in blue. Um, the uh, DLA alpha is in gray, and the LLA alpha is in red. And the DLA and LLA alpha alphas are basically really, really similar. So we saw the best increase here at pH 4. So now it was really that switching that I was kind of like, okay, well, polymorph conversion um, can be really problematic if you have a polymorph that has non-ideal properties. So what I wanted to do is see if we could change from one polymorph to the other. So polymorph conversion definitely has precedent. So single component solids, you can use temperature, pressure, even mechanochemistry to sometimes convert from one to the other. Um, so for single component solids, definitely precedent. Even for multi-component solids, there's precedent for that as well. But what we were interested in in the literature was really digging in and trying to see if we could find a multi-component solid that was also pharmaceutical and was converted by mechanochemistry or mechanochemical methods. Um, so we didn't have access to a high pressure system or anything like that. Um, the other thing we were interested in, just out of my own curiosity, is I wanted to know if we could cycle and go from alpha to beta to alpha to beta or back again. So we found two papers that were really inspirational for us. One by Jeremy Sanders lab, looking at theophylline and benzamide um, coat crystals where they had two different forms. And they showed that depending on the solvent identity and concentration, they could synthesize one or the other and then reversibly switch back and forth between them. And then Thomas Lafritz's group has looked at coat crystals of nicotinamide and adipic acid. And by changing the milling jar material or the size of the milling balls, they showed that you could go from form one to form two reversibly. So we took this kind of as inspiration, and we knew that stirring in water was going to result in the betas changing to alpha. So our question was really, OK, do we need contact with a liquid to do the conversion? Do we need mechanochemical force, or do we need both? So what we did is we took the beta and we just set it in water without mechanical agitation. And what we saw is that the beta did not convert to alpha if we didn't stir it. We took single crystals and put those in a solution. And you can see a little bit of dissolving over time. But if you pluck the crystal out and do a unit cell analysis, it does not change to the alpha form. So it's not simply like a surface contact that initiates the change all the way through the crystal. So then what we did is we took away solvent and we did neat milling to try to test if it was just force. And if you take the alpha or beta polymorphs, any of the four, and you neat mill them, what you see is a decrease in the crystallinity, but you do not see conversion. So then we were thinking, okay, it's got to be both. So if we do liquid-assisted grinding, that gives us force and solvent with a, our contact with a liquid. And if we do slurry experiments, same thing, mechanochemical agitation as well as liquid contact. And in these cases, we can either start with the alpha and use certain solvents, um, acetonitrile water by liquid-assisted grinding, and go to the beta. Or we could start with the beta and use methanol and go back to the alpha. And the same thing is true if we start and put that solid material into a slurry experiment. Certain solvents will convert to the beta. Certain ones will convert to the alpha. So the alpha has that five times higher um, solubility. The other thing we could do was reversibly cycle it. So we could start with the alpha powder that we had made. We could do liquid-assisted grinding, convert it to the beta, do another liquid-assisted grinding with a different solvent, convert it back to the alpha. And same thing with the slurry experiment. So we could start with alpha or with beta and reversibly cycle it, which is a really nice way, especially if you have something with non-ideal properties and you get batch synthesis and you get the polymorph you don't want, you can actually convert it to the other one, which is great. Um, and the liquid assisted grinding is relatively green. 50 microliters of solvent isn't too much at all. Alrighty, the last story I want to quickly tell you about today is how we're addressing challenges in crystallization. So this is work by my former graduate student, Jesus Daniel Loya. And so we have been working with this drug, Bezafibrate, which is an anti-cholesterol drug. Um, we were actually the first to be able to successfully co-crystallize the drug. It really likes to crystallize by itself because it has these amine and acid groups which form really nice hydrogen bonded tetramers. And so getting it to want to hydrogen bond to something else is a bit tricky. But we had figured that out and successfully made co-crystal of it for the first time. Um, and we had just been trying some other molecules to kind of see how well our strategy was working. And Daniel was trying to crystallize the bezafibrate with these compounds that are liquids. So the pyridines, they're not really used as solvent so much, but liquid compounds. 
And every time he tried to do co-crystallization in solution, he was getting oiling out, which is really common for things that are oils or liquids, or he was just getting single crystals of the benzofibrate by itself. It is polymorphic, and the polymers are really clearly identifiable just by an optical microscope. Um, so you know really quickly if your co-crystallization is failing, because I think Daniel saw these you know, hundreds and hundreds of times, and we would know immediately, nope, that co-crystallization did not work. So we could have walked away and said, well, that's frustrating and annoying. Let's just not try anymore. Um, but I decided to push Daniel a little bit and said, listen, oiling out is a huge problem. So let's try and see if we can develop a method that would actually give us co-crystal. So at that point, we had been dabbling in mechanochemistry a little bit. And what we did is we actually neat milled the two components. And neat milling gave us a viscous oil, just kind of like it did in solution. But we took that oil and we dissolved it in a solvent. And once we did that, we did slow evaporation and we got co-crystals of the components. If you skip the milling step and just do solvent evaporation, it doesn't give you co-crystals. And so we dived into this a little bit more. Um, I guess first I'll show you, we actually got the first crystalline forms of three out of those four pyridines. They've never been successfully incorporated into a solid phase before. So the three methyl derivatives and the three PMBA, um, the structures, They've never been um, a structure of those compounds before. The hydrogen bonding is actually kind of complicated, even though the molecules are pretty simple, because you've got amide hydrogen bonding. Um, we've got some partial deprotonation, so it's kind of a, an interesting structure to look at. Um, and then with the PMDA, we actually had two forms, a two to one and a one to one, which I'll tell you about in just a second. But we were really interested in kind of like, why does milling help us get to these co-crystals? So what we did is we did some IR spectroscopy the co-crystals in blue, the oil directly after milling is in red, and a failed solution slow evaporation is in green, so something that didn't work. And what we could tell by the IR is that we had really nice correlation of the co-crystal and the oil from milling, but a failed solution evaporation had peaks that were shifted or absent when compared to the other two. We also did powder x-ray diffraction on the oil from milling and see it's actually relatively crystalline. Um, it doesn't have large enough crystals to pull out, but there's definitely crystallinity there by powder x-ray diffraction. Um, with the PMDA, this was how we figured out there were probably two forms. Um, we did the IR spectroscopy, and we saw bad correlation with the two-to-one, and that gave us insight that maybe we had another form, and then ultimately we isolated the one-to-one -one form, and you can see really nice correlation there. The other great thing is once you've made those co-crystals, you've done milling, slow evaporation, you have those crystals in hand, you can go back to the lab, set up a fresh solution crystallization, drop one in, and then spit it out in solution when you normally could not do that. So once you have the seed crystals in hand, you can actually make them by solution methods. We did some slow seeding and fast, which is just how concentrated or how much time we were using. And in the PMDA case, what we saw is by slow seeding, we got the one-to-one. -one, and by fast seeding, we got a mixture of two-to-one and one-to-one. -one. So I think two-to-one is probably a kinetic product. Um, so we think mechanochemistry basically facilitates that co-crystal formation. Um, and then we have these seeds that you can then use afterwards. Um, so we had to cover crystal growth and design for this. Um, I want to point out, we let the oil sit for several months undisturbed, and they don't spontaneously give us big enough crystals. Um, but one case that I think points out the uniqueness is if we take the 3 methylaminopyridine and the benzofibrate and do solution crystallization in dichloromethane, no product. But if we do milling, then slow evaporation from dichloromethane, then we actually get crystalline material. What we want to do, this was our, we have a little bit of preliminary data that's for a different system that is showing this kind of works. When solution methods fail, we can use milling to get material, and we actually get it directly. We don't even need to redissolve. Um, but we're looking at maybe doing some in situ characterization of milling or some micro ED or something. So uh, we don't have access to that. If you're interested or you have resources, please let me know. Uh, so with that, I just want to conclude and say that we've shown that mixed co-crystals are a platform we can use to fine-tune thermal expansion behavior. And even though your bulk material appears isostructural, differences at the molecular level that you can see by X-ray diffraction um, can afford differences in properties of that material. I showed you some switchable thermal expansion behavior, which we're really excited about that project. Um, and also with the pharmaceuticals, some reversible polymorph interconversion, improvement in properties, and ways to facilitate crystallization of things that are frustrated. And then the last thing I'm going to just say for a second is we've used, um, we have the back of Chrysanthemum, where we're doing some Diels Alter reactions, and we have the nice single crystal in the background. Um, this is work by my graduate student, Gary. So we can covalently connect molecules and then change thermal expansion because we go from something weak to something stronger. So that's an area that we're just starting to dive into. 
So with that, I want to acknowledge my group. Um, I have the pleasure of working with a fabulous group of scientists, and honestly, without all of their work, I wouldn't be up here today to be able to tell you about all this. So today, I highlighted work from Daniel, from Navkarin, Shouten, Shishan, and Gary and Yule. Um, I'd like to acknowledge collaborators, Ryan Brenneman, Ben Wandy, Eric Reinheimer, who helped on the data you saw today. Um, uh, the thermal expansion work is funded by the National Science Foundation and ACSPRF, and the pharmaceutical work is funded by the Welch Foundation. So I'd like to acknowledge funding agencies. And lastly, just a personal announcement. Um, Texas has been lovely for the last few years, but my group is actually relocating in the next month to the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. So we're gonna be housed in the chemistry building here. Um, and a fun fact about Mizzou, if you didn't know, it actually has the highest powered um, university research reactor in the United States. There's a lot of radiopharmaceutical work. So we're gonna see if um, we can maybe have some nice collaboration with radiopharmaceuticals as well. So with that, I think I'm out of time. Um, again, thank you to the ACA for the award. I'm incredibly honored and grateful. Thank you to my lab. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. for an absolutely amazing talk. We do have time for a couple of questions. And my new crystallographer, Steven, is in the audience. <laughs> Very excited about that. Thank you. It was an excellent talk, Kristen. Um, you mentioned uh, using an approach where you use basically isomorphous substitution to get a three-component co-crystal, and how difficult it is to predict those. Um, but organic double salts are pretty easy to make. Do you think you could use crystal structures of organic double salts to get uh, crystal engineering templates for a three-component co-crystal? Yeah, I think that's a great idea, actually. I might might have to push that when I get back to lab. That's a great idea, Stephen. Yeah, awesome. I think I think for sure. I could say it was really interesting talk for me because I work on um, both pharmaceuticals and alien more open source. Which is talk. It, yeah, so I said in my cryptography, so it was really interesting talk for me. Uh, I have several questions. I can catch you up after this, but I have one question in particular for uh, pharmaceutical uh, part. Uh, you said um, I also have faced that uh, kind of like those changes in like the polymorphism uh, where you grind sometimes and it changes immediately and you use different um, materials, to set. for example, you can use crucible or glass container to make your oil moss. Like, uh, you can you comment on uh, actual reason why it might be a reason, uh, a surface area or the type of materials we use to uh, make our crystals is the reason for oil moss? Yes, yes. So we haven't had a lot of trouble with different materials giving us different phases. Um, but the paper I pointed out by Tomislav Fritsch's group, I think that was the first paper showing that the milling jar vessel would actually give you different polymers. Because I think prior to that, it also, you know, mechanochemistry is actually a very old technique, right? But it's sort of undergoing a renaissance right now. Um, and prior to that, I think people assumed, oh, you can just use whatever jar. You're going to get the same thing if you keep the rest of the conditions the same. And they were the first group to look at that and show, no, this material gives you this polymorph and this material gives you a different one. Um, I think it, it must be a surface contact effect, right? Um, that somehow that is giving you favoring one polymorph or the other. We haven't personally had a lot of issues with it yet, but I, we don't have different milling jars either. Um, when I showed this to Thomas Lott, he was like, maybe we should send you some jars that are something different. I was like, yes, that'd be great. So, I think also work on like RAM, of course. Oh, so yes. Yes. Perfect. That would be awesome. Thanks. Peggy would be so happy. I, yeah. so I, but, but I have a question. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> uh, the question is the homogeneity of the solid solutions. Because I, I remember being told decades ago by somebody who did their whole life's work in that, in mm -hmm. Germany, that you had to crystallize from a solution, uh, from a volume large enough that the composition of the solution did not change during the crystallization. Mm -hmm. Right. So we were initially thinking with the SEMD, SEM EDS because Essentially, you could have, you know, truly a solid solution that's perfectly mixed all the way through the entire crystal at every position. Or potentially, you could have it a little bit more random. 
I think it is probably a little bit more random unless you're controlling it that perfectly. What we're trying to do next is to design a system where the SEM EDS would actually give you, we would have some clearer differences in those molecules where it would be like, okay, we're gonna see you know, chlorine for this and maybe iodine or so, something a little bit different. Um, the SEM EDS there, we were like, maybe we'll get lucky and see a little bit of you know, patterning or you know, positions of one over the other to show either homogeneous or not. Um, but I don't think we can say with certainty until we pick a system that would really clearly show those differences. I think that is probably a bit more random, to be honest, um, rather than you know perfect at every position unless you control that just incredibly well. Congratulations, great, great talk. Thank you. Can, can you be a little bit more specific about the nature of this uh, rotational movement uh, you mentioned in the first part of the talk? Is it correlated when, when two uh, neighboring fragments uh, rotate? Uh, do they do this, uh, say, clockwise, both oh. one, one clockwise, the other anti-clockwise? Can you be? Can you? I don't know if we. I don't know if we, any, I don't know if we know that yet. That if specifically one is going clockwise, the other is going counter. I don't know if we could say that. Even with, I don't even know that with solid state NMR without some labeling. Maybe with labeling, you could dig out if there were, you know, how many unique peaks you would expect to see if they're moving simultaneously versus different. That's a great, great idea. But I think you'd need label. I think you'd need to label it in order to get a signal that's, like, you know, really, really apparent. But no, we don't know if the neighboring are are, are the same or, or opposite. Yeah, it would be great to to have like directional movement and to simply be able to. To somehow uh, do this in a concepted way. Or right, right. We're looking, I'll give a little, I think we're still a bit away from this, so I don't want to spoil it. We're looking at making um, unsymmetrical molecules with yeah. different yeah, motion yeah. groups that yes. where one would be more prone to motion than the other. And so hopefully digging out a little bit with that, but that's super preliminary. But in your opinion, is this a macroscopic movement of, of these groups or just like a quantum jump between two positions? Oh, I think. Is it it, some motion can be macroscopic for sure. We have a different system. So we have a different system, again, unpublished as of now, that we do actually see macroscopic crystal changes. So you can put it on the diffractometer and you can actually physically see the difference. And we know that by all the structures that it's undergoing motion, it's also doing some ring flipping and things. So in some of that, you can get actually macroscopic changes, depending on the system. Okay, thank you very much.